Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Symphony Con, Berlin. Um, thank you for coming. I'm very impressed, you know, with, we have so many people today. I'm very excited about what I'm going to talk today. Uh, also very excited for the keynote tomorrow, which is going to be very different from what I'm going to announce uh, today. Um, so the first keynote is about the state of Symphony in the cloud. Uh, so, this is a page from the very first book ever written on, P on Symfony, not on PHP, on Symfony uh, more than 10 years ago. And as you can see, back then, we were very, um, or at least I was very proud of this command task, Symfony Sync Production Go. It was the best way to actually deploy your website um, not in the cloud back then, but on a production server. Um, I was very proud even if the code was not that complex, it was kind of easy. It was a simple wrapper around uh, Linux tools, uh, but it helped a lot. Um, also because back then, deploying a website was much easier. It was just about syncing the code from a local computer, most of the time, to your production server. Um, so this task was simple, it was convenient, and really powerful. So I still have the book at home, and I wanted to quote uh, a few paragraphs from the book. Um, so the most common way to deploy a project production is to transfer all its files by FTP. How many of you are still using FTP to actually deploy a website? I mean, not me, but... I'm sure some people here are doing that. I mean, that's fine. And, and, and if you are doing WordPress, for instance, uh, work or something like that, it may make sense. Uh, if your website is um, simple enough with not too much traffic, that might make sense. And of course, back then, it was all about subversion. Anyone using subversion anymore? Yeah, one? Yes, two. Thank you. So, we were talking also about the fact that sending the root project directory with FTP is fine for the very first deploy. Um, but then, if you want to upload an update, uploading all the files were kind of not uh, the best way. So, the solution uh, supporting the Symfony was to actually use our sync to uh, synchronize the files uh, from your computer to uh, the server using an SSH layer. And it was kind of funny back then, more and more commercial hosts support an SSH channel, uh, which is kind of funny because it supposed that, you know, having a hosting solution without an SSH access nowadays is probably a no-go for most of us. And then we also had a good recommendation uh, don't forget to clear the cache, right? Um, but notice that we were advising to clear the cache after synchronization because you needed to clear the cache on the production server, um, which is probably not a good practice anymore, uh, especially if you have a web application with a large amount of traffic. If you are doing that, um, you are going to have requests competing for uh, you know, you're going to have a risk condition, basically, where several requests are going to try to write to the cache. So uh, it can lead to a broken cache state, really. So everything was about the code, right? And back then we were using Propel, and I think, if I remember correctly, that Propel did not have anything about um, migration. So it was not even possible to actually migrate uh, the code uh, the database schema directly with uh, PHP. You needed something else. So, what about code deployment in 2016? Um, so, I wrote a book, the Symphony book, in 2006, and a year after, Heroku was created. And we did not know that at that time, but uh, Heroku was about to change everything, really. Uh, basically, platforms as a service were born. And then we add Google App Engine, even if the first version was really just about Python, and then they added PHP support. Um, and the focus of, of uh, those early uh, platform as a service um, 
services. Um, it was all about scaling the code, right? So the core technology was really just about um, a router layer dispatching requests um, to a mesh of isolated environments. And when I say isolated environments, I think that nowadays the, the good word would be container. Um, <clears throat> but being able to scale the code and making it uh, highly available, um, it comes with some trade-offs. And the first one is that you need a mostly read-only file system. Most of the, those platforms, they want you to actually have a read-only file system. And as you can imagine, um, having a read-only file system means that you can't FTP uh, your code uh, to the production servers. That's not possible anymore. So that's the first thing. And then, most of these platforms, because they want a read-only file system, and that includes Docker, uh, they introduce the notion of a two-step deployment. The build phase and the runtime. So it's, it's a bit like Java. You need to compile the code first, and then uh, there is an artifact or several artifacts, and then you move that to the production servers. So, of course, you don't need to compile PHP, but nowadays you probably have some task to do before deploying the code. The first one is probably to use Composer install to install your PHP dependencies. Uh, you probably uh, have to um, warm up your cache, the Symfony cache, the container, the templates, um, the doctrine proxies, and a bunch of other things, um, um, translation as well. And of course, you probably have some, um, it's not just about PHP, you probably also have some tasks to generate, compile, optimize your assets, JavaScript, style sheets, something like that. And finally, the build nowadays is not done anymore on your local machine. You have a distant server. It can be a Jenkins server, a continuous integration server, some kind of uh, uh, distant machine, which means that you have three different environments really for your code. You have your local laptop, you have uh, the built machine, and then you have the production server. And you might have some differences between all those environments. And of course, if they are the same, that's better, but most of the time, that's not the case. Um, which means that if you build the cache on a server, you need to be sure that um, you don't depend on something specific on the server, like the PHP version, uh, the PHP extensions that you have, or even you don't want to rely on the absolute path where you are actually building um, the cache. So you need to avoid hard-coded uh, things there. So, the build should not depend on anything but your code, uh, the code that you've actually uh, written. And of course, because we have this read-only um, artifact, at some point you also need some dynamic configuration like you want to connect to a database. And of course, you don't want to hardcode the database password, the credentials, or the host, the IP of the server in your cache. So you need some kind of mechanisms like environment variables, for instance. So how does Symfony work on those systems? Well, Symfony 3.2 is much better in this regard than Symfony 2.0. See, if you are uh, trying Symfony 2.0, and trying to generate a cache which is read-only, good luck. It's just not possible. So we uh, actually did a lot of work trying to make Symfony aware of all those constraints so that we are sure that it works really well in those, uh, on those platforms. So, and having a read-only file system is really a challenge in Symfony because the framework internally heavily relies on the fact that it can write to some directories to generate some cache. And the cache is really important for Symfony because that's the way we can actually improve the performance of the application. Um, so the great thing about Symfony is that from day one, at least Symfony version two, I don't remember for Symfony version one, but for, for Symfony version two, we only ever 
write in two different directories, the cache directory and the logs directory. And for the logs, it's kind of optional, so you don't need a, a logs directory per se, but you need a cache directory. And since day one, you can configure them directly into your kernel class, so you can move that somewhere where it's more practical. So that helps, but obviously it's not enough. Um, it's not enough because in 2.0 and until 3.2 actually, uh, Symfony use uh, some absolute path uh, in the generated code. And I think the very first time someone asked for actually removing the absolute path is from uh, the cache was this issue uh, from 2011. So it, it was more than five years ago. Actually, November 29th. So it was exactly five years ago. Um, and it was not really about platform as a service. It was not about the cloud. It was just about trying to build a site in a temporary directory, warm up the cache from production mode on the build server, and then being able to rc the code to the production servers. So the big difference here between the build server and the production server is that the cache is not built in the same directory as um, the production server where the code is going to be run. So the first attempt to solve this problem uh, was in uh, 2012. Um, and actually, I'm not going to talk about all the complexity there, but trust me, it was a very difficult problem to solve. So it was the first attempt, and it was uh, closed, uh, because back then, it seemed quite impossible to achieve. There were so many places where we uh, were relying on the absolute path of um, the root directory of Symfony where your application is installed, that, so that we were so far away from being able to do that, that we actually closed that and, and, and saying it's just not possible. But people kept coming back with the same needs, uh, with quite a few different uh, deployment strategies. So here we have one, we have another one with PHP FPM using a CH root, and so a lot of different things. But the problem was almost always the same. I want uh, to remove all the absolute paths from the generated cache. Um, so this was the second attempt. Uh, it was merged in uh, 2014, yes, um, in Symfony 2.3 as a bug fix, but it was quickly reverted because um, it introduced a bunch of regressions. Um, so the next attempt was for Symphony 2.6, and then again I closed that because um, you can read the slide, it's not that interesting, but the thing is it was not good enough, it did not really work that well. And finally we merged a good solution at the end of 2014, uh, and it was merged as a bug fix for uh, Symphony 2.3, which means that um, in Symfony 2.3, the latest versions, um, and, and we don't care about that because it's not maintained anymore, but at least if you're using 2.7, which is the uh, oldest version that we are still maintaining, uh, the problem is actually solved. Um, it's, it was solved not in just this poor request because at some point we realized that uh, we had some performance issues, so we had a bunch of other poor requests, and this one is interesting. If you have a look at uh, the cache and where the, the, the PHP container is actually dumped, you can see that we actually replaced um, <clears throat> all the DNA function calls to this target deer. So ahead of time, uh, when we construct uh, the, 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 the container, we create a bunch of properties where we actually store uh, all the directory names so that it's much faster at runtime. So problem solved. Well, not really, because it was just about removing absolute paths from the dumped container. But of course, we have absolute paths everywhere in the cache. So it was also the case for templates, for instance. Uh, so we fixed that um, as well. And then we also had uh, problems with, with Twig, so it, it took um, some more time. And as you can see here, so no, you can't see that. 
probably, but the last two ones were actually merged this year in August and October, which means that um, if you really want to be sure that you don't have any absolute pathies in your cache, you need to use Symfony 3.2. Before that, it doesn't work. Okay, and so Twig is an interesting story because it was not that easy to actually um, be aware of the problem because if you have a look at the cache, there is no outcoded absolute path anywhere. But the thing is, the class names uh, are actually a SHA-1 and the SHA-1 actually depends on the absolute path where your templates are uh, stored, which means that to spot that, it was kind of uh, interesting. Um, so it took some time to figure that out. It's fixed now. Um, so it was fixed in Twig 125, but you really want to use uh, Twig 128 if you want all the fixes because we had some problems and it took some time to actually figure out how to fix everything. So the good news is that it works really well. Um, and there is a side effect uh, of this specific bug. Um, or I'm not, I'm not sure if it's a bug of feature, but whatever. Um, when you create a cache on a build server, and if the directory is not the same as the directory where the cache is actually going to be stored in production, it means that for the very first request, the class names for the Twig templates are going to be different, which means that for the very first request, Twig will a actually um, regenerate the cache. Right? So two problems, if you have a read-only file system, it does not work. And then, even if you don't have a read-only file system, that's a problem because for the very first request, Twig needs to generate some cache, which is uh, not a good idea. Okay, um, let's move on. So, having relative path is great, but that's just part of the story. There is more than that. And people also ask for um, read-only file system. So the fact that we don't have actual paths is great, but it's not enough. And, and having a read-only file system is a totally different story, and that's very important, for instance, on Google App Engine. And I think that's the very first uh, request about that um, in 2013. Um, and it proved to be even more difficult to achieve. Um, because we need to have a reliable way to actually generate all the cache, which means everything from doctrine proxies to templates to translations, uh, including the PHP container, of course. And Symfony has a special feature for that. That's the cache warmers, and it was introduced really early on. But we need to be sure that the cache warmers are actually able to generate all the cache, everything. Of course, it was not the case back then, which means that even if you just wanted to have everything that the cash warmers were able to generate, it was not even possible in one pass. So you need to refresh one, two, three times before actually having all the cash um, from the cash warmers. So that was the first problem. And the second one was that we had some missing cash warmers. Uh, so two problems to fix. So we started to add more um, cache warmer classes and we fixed the fact that uh, uh, the cache warmer was not able to actually generate everything from day one. And so I won't tell the whole, the whole story because it's a long story, of course. Um, but the good news is that as of Symfony 3.2 released yesterday, um, and for the very first time in Symfony history, Symfony is able to warm up all its cache in an independent way uh, which means that uh, the cache does not depend anymore on the directory under which you actually generated the cache uh, and should not depend on the PHP version, um, uh, at least for anything um, related to Symfony. And that's quite an achievement. It took four to five years to actually get there. And I wanted to talk this story today because, you know, Symfony is not just about wow features. We like to have new features in Symfony, but Symfony is also about a lot of things and a lot of features, a lot of changes that we are doing behind the scenes so that your experience when using Symfony is much better. Right? So it's not rewarding because how many of you were actually um, aware of everything I've just talked about? 
See? Okay, just a few people. Um, are we done yet? Yes and no. Um, and I can see a couple of improvements that we can do for Symfony 3.3. So the first one is, I want to propose to actually deprecate the cache clear um, command. Or at least to remove or deprecate the cache warming part of cache clear. Because first, if you have a look at the code, I think you won't understand how it works. I don't. Not anymore. We fixed a bunch of things there. It's a nightmare to maintain. It does not really work well. So the thing is, we have the old kernel and we want to generate a new one. So we have two different classes, so we need to change the names. We can't generate the cache. Thank you. Uh, we can't generate the, uh, the same class name, so we need to add a prefix or a suffix, and then we need to change back to uh, the original name, and then we need to move back the cache somewhere. That's a nightmare, it doesn't work. Um, and, and, and so I want to remove that. So I think it makes sense um, because most of the time, when we are talking about a two step deployment, where you have a build phase and a, a deploy phase, during the build phase, you don't need to clear the cache. There is nothing there. So what you want to be able to do is to actually warm up the cache. And we have the cache warm up command, which works really great. So you don't really need to clear the cache and warm up the cache in one step. If you are doing that in production, that's very dangerous anyway. You need to put your uh, website um, on maintenance before doing that. If you're not doing that, you can have a broken cache uh, really easily if you have some incoming requests at the same time. So that's the first thing I want um, to propose for Symfony 3.3. Um, and the first one, oh, that's interesting. So that, that was this slide actually, and now I'm going to talk about this one, which is totally different. Um, so the thing is, if we want to have a read-only file system, we want to be sure that you don't put anything under var cache, right? So anything under var cache should be things that we can generate with a cache warmer, right? Um, and only that, if you are using var cache as a temporary directory, that won't work anymore. So I propose to actually decouple that and create a new one, var TMP, where you can put temporary things and on the servers in the cloud and, and, and Docker and, and, and or Heroku and things, you do have access to a, um, a temporary directory. That's not a problem. So var cache is really for anything that can be warmed up first and then var TMP to actually be able to store some temporary files. There is nothing to change, really, in Symfony. It's just a best practice. It's just, uh, you know, uh, we can change the Symfony standard edition uh, to add this directory by default. We need to expose that directory uh, somewhere in the framework and done. So I think it's kind of easy, actually. Okay, wow. So that was a long story, uh, but we are not done yet. We've just talked about um, deploying the code, but of course, nowadays, your application depends on more than that. You depends on services, a database layer, a cache service, um, Elasticsearch, a queue system, um, whatever. And here the framework can naturally help, um, or not that much really. Uh, and that's the limit between the code and the infrastructure. At some point you need some other tools, right? But what we can do is, even if you have uh, the services, so we're going to talk about the services afterwards, but you need a way to actually wire uh, your application to the services. And remember, we have a read-only cache, so that's kind of interesting because we are not aware of the services when we are building the cache. Uh, but then in production, we need to be able to connect to those things. And again, you don't want the credentials to be part of the cache. So, um, you need some way to actually have dynamic uh, values, uh, and that's where environment variables can be uh, very useful. Um, are you still with me? Yeah, because this one is really complex as well. Um, 
Because, you know, if removing absolute pathies from the cache was challenging, uh, fixing environment variables in Symfony was actually even more complex. So we do have support for environment variables in Symfony with the Symfony underscore underscore uh, convention, but it doesn't work well, uh, so we, we needed something uh, better and something that was first class, a first class citizen in Symfony, which was not the case. Okay, so that's a bunch of pull requests. A lot of people actually tried to fix the issue, including myself. We failed. Um, I can't see Magnus over there. You also tried to fix that. Thank you for that. Um, it, and actually, at, after some years trying to find the right solution, we actually fixed the problem. It's not pretty. I would say it's kind of ugly. Sorry, Nicholas. And thank you for actually fixing the problem. But the good news is that Symfony 3.2 actually supports environment variables, uh, which is great. And here I want to uh, thank David Zulke, I'm not sure if he's uh, here somewhere, uh, because he was the one uh, who actually encouraged us to find a solution more than once and he was always willing to try our solutions and giving feedback because it was very important for him and for Heroku. Um, so he helped a lot. So here is how it works. Um, so it's based on a convention, actually, and that's why it's kind of ugly. It's not, so here, when, when we are saying and something, it's not a function call. As you can see, we have uh, the same convention as uh, a regular parameter, because as far as Symfony is concerned, that's just a parameter. We have uh, some mechanism to actually convert that to get off uh, and value, but behind the scenes, it's, it's handled like it was a parameter. And that's why if you want to define a default value, you can use this trick. You can just say on database host, local host. That's the default value if the environment variable is not defined. Okay? So that's available in Symfony 3.2 as well. Um, so I think now we've, we've covered everything that we can do uh, on the Symfony side. Uh, there is nothing more than we can do. But there, there are two remaining topics now. The first one is how do you actually provision the services that you are relying on and how you manage the data uh, from those services. And of course, we can't do that uh, with Symfony. There are a lot of tools, most of them are complex. I don't like them, I'm not going to give names. Um, and, and I don't like them because they involve a lot of code or some code, and they are totally decoupled from your code, which is not really good. And for most of us, you know, having just a small configuration file where you can actually describe the services you want to rely on, um, I think that's just good enough for, uh, for most of us. It should be as simple as what we're doing with Composer. If you want to rely on a PHP dependency, you just add a dependency in your composer.json file. Done. Nothing more. And, and of course, um, I want to be able to do that with uh, my services. Because if I can say, OK, I depend on Redis and, and, and MySQL, for instance, then the only problem is how can I do the wiring? And then using environment variables is the way to go. So that sounds good. So I look around, and I think a lot of you actually are aware of that because I talked a bit about that uh, last year during the keynote, but I fell in love with uh, Platform SH, um, which is a great framework to actually build a platform as a service. And, you know, I created a bunch of frameworks, so I didn't want to actually reinvent the wheel. I didn't want to actually create a framework to create a platform as a service. So I reused something for the very first time in my life. Wow, that's great. It, it feels great to actually not build everything from scratch. And so today I'm very proud to announce Sensor Cloud, uh, which is a platform service optimized for Symfony, which actually implements the missing parts I've just talked about. Uh, so let me explain that. Um, so it, it works a bit like what we have with the Composer, the JSON file, with uh, the PHP dependencies. The first thing you can do is you can actually define the dependencies that are not really uh, PHP code. So the first thing is 
uh, I can declare that I'm actually depending on Redis and APC and PostgreSQL. We can also define the dependencies that are not PHP related because nowadays when you are building your code, you need more tools. Uh, it can be Ruby tools, it can be Node.js tools, it can be Python tools, whatever. So that's something you can do with a configuration file. And then you can do the same with the services. Here I'm saying that I'm uh, depending on uh, PostgreSQL and cache. And as you can see, this is really just configuration file. There is no code involved. So it's a static uh, definition of what I want for um, my website. And that's one big difference with many platforms of service uh, offering, uh, because we take care of your entire infrastructure. So if you want to depend on PostgreSQL, MySQL, RabbitMQ, um, Elasticsearch, uh, Kafka, whatever, the configuration is actually done in the exact same way. But the most interesting feature is that everything is actually uh, defined um, alongside your code. So those files are actually stored alongside your code, which means that they are actually part of your Git repository. How many of you are not using Git? Ah, really? Okay, that's very good news. Um, so it means that if you are using Git, those services, those dependencies, they are actually managed as first-class Git citizens. Um, so that's, that's kind of complex to understand. Uh, so I've... Um, so let me explain. Let's say I want to work on a new feature or I want to fix a bug. I can do that. Sensor Cloud branch, feed DB, so here I'm going to, I don't know, add a DB service to my uh, website, and I want to fork uh, or to branch from uh, the master branch. So, of course, it creates a new Git branch, but it also creates um, a new branch for my services and my dependencies because the configuration is actually part of uh, the Git repository. So it means that it's going to create a new cluster of servers uh, with all the services defined there, which means that if you actually change the code, if you fix a bug, uh, if you add a new dependency, if you add a new service, if you remove a service, it's going to be uh, done on the new cluster. But even better than that, the data from all those services are also cloned in the new environment. Um, so you, it, it's like, you know, you have an access to a snapshot of the production data. And the snapshot is actually consistent, which means that you have the database data, for instance, and at the same time, we take a snapshot of the Redis cache and your Elasticsearch uh, content, for instance. So you make some changes. Whenever you push, actually, um, the code is deployed, of course, uh, but the updated service definition as well. Uh, it does not impact the production servers, of course. Uh, so it means that whenever you are doing that, uh, it feels like you are actually working directly on the production servers, which is not the case, of course. Um, and I think, you know, if you are old enough, uh, 10 or 15 years ago, it was exactly what we were doing. We were connecting on the production server uh, because we were not able to figure out what, why there was a bug in production because the data were, were, were different, the PHP version was different, the services were different. So it was much easier to actually connect to the production server, do uh, some changes, um, log some things, and trying to figure out how to fix the bug. It's not the case anywhere, uh, anymore, but with Sensor Cloud, we allow you to do exactly that, but in a safe way. Um, and then, of course, it means that because you have the production data for your um, branch, it means that you can also interact with um, the data directly from a browser um, and, 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 or, or a curl if you have an API or, or, or something like that. And you can even synchronize the data back from the parent branch, so for, for, uh, from the production servers back to your branch. So if at some point you have more data in production, you can also get them back on your branch. Uh, that's, that's pretty cool. And the last step, of course, if, is that you can merge back uh, the feature branch into its parent branch, 
And if that's the master branch, it means that you are going to deploy to production all the changes, the code, the services, and all the dependencies. And of course, we don't deploy the data from your uh, uh, feature branch to uh, the master branch, of course. So behind the scenes, uh, it, it works with Git, of course, um, but it does not rely on any specific Git workflow, which means that whatever the workflow you are using, you can um, use SensorCloud, and SensorCloud adapts to what you are already doing. And getting started is one common way, SensorCloud init, it gives you a good sensible default. We figure out which services you are actually using currently in your project, in your Symfony project, so that you have a good starting point. And I'm very excited about that because it opens up a lot of opportunities, especially when you, are, uh, when you have a continuous integration workflow because you can run your functional test with real data. You can take browser captures. Um, uh, you can run um, Blackfire performance tests, for instance, not just with features, uh, but you know, with the exact same infrastructure as your production environment, which means that you can also show uh, your new feature to your boss or customer without any lorem ipsum, right? And you know that a customer doesn't like lorem ipsum. You say, no, that's not the right way. So that's a great way also to detect issues in your code before deploying the code to production, right? If you have an N plus one query because of a misconfiguration of doctrine, you can spot that right away if you have a couple of fake records in the DB, that's not that easy. It's very complex, so you deploy production, all of a sudden it, it's, it's really slow and you don't understand why. It's an easy fix, but it takes time. It's very stressful, so if we can avoid that, that's even better. And SensorCloud also helps with local development. Instead of installing all the services locally on a laptop and having different version or slightly different configuration. What you can do is you can open a tunnel like that, and then you have access to all the services from the branch you are working on. So you can have different branches, different clusters, different infrastructures, different data everywhere. everywhere. Um, and I don't know you, but I've been dreaming of such a possibility for years. It makes developing so easy. You just have to have a laptop, PHP, done. You can work, uh, of course, if you have a Wi-Fi connection that works, and hopefully it's going to work today. Uh, and the best part is, so I've talked about how you can use SensorCloud for uh, development. So your development environment, your laptop, staging, um, testing, but the best part is actually production, because our production setups come with a triple redundancy stack, which means that we can guarantee 99.99% .99 SLA on the entire stack. And that's the key point, the entire stack. Because we are managing all your services, we can guarantee that. 99.99 on everything, PHP, the network, uh, and all the services, MySQL, whatever you want. And of course, because we are managing the infrastructure, it also means that the latency is really good, right? If you are... Um, using third-party services that are not on the same network, so the latency is not that good, right? Um, that was the good news. The bad news is that it's not available yet. We are still working on finishing everything. We are almost there. Uh, it's going to be available early next year. Um, so yeah, so that's Sensor Cloud. It builds on all the Symfony 3.2 improvements that we've made um, during the last year, and everything I've just talked about today, actually. Uh, it gives the developer a great experience when working on Symfony projects. Um, and if you want to learn more about Sensor Cloud, we have, we have a booth at the conference, so you can go there. We're going to do, do some demonstration today and tomorrow, because of course, uh, I've talked about a very small amount of the features that we have um, on Sensor Cloud. Um, and I think that's all for today. Thank you very much for listening and enjoy the conference.